when economists discovered that there is much more to human nature than selfish behavior, they started experimenting with altruistic and spiteful preferences. They also started doing research on the sense of fairness across countries and types of individuals under a variety of scenarios. In other words, they started doing social experiments to learn more about human nature and preferences. One of the well-known social experiments is the so-called ultimatum game. This video is about this game. Unlike the games we've seen so far, the ultimatum game is played in stages. We give the chance to one of the players to decide first, and then the other player decides only after the first uh, has decided. We call these games sequential. They're played in sequence. The invisible hand game we've seen before in the Prisoner's Dilemma games we discussed so far are played simultaneously for all players. We call those games simultaneous. Now, back to the ultimatum game, which is a sequential game, right? So there are two players in this game, a proposer and the responder. Let's assume that they're friends walking uphill the A30 to, uh, on their way to, to a lecture for all hallway. One of them sees a uh, hundred bucks on the street. Ooh, sweet. The rules of the game um, stipulate that whoever found the hundred bucks proposes a split of this windfall uh, to the other player. And this is how one of them becomes a proposer and the other one can only then respond. So what does the proposer propose? The proposer has found $100 on the street, so they can propose anything between zero and 100. At the same time, the responder has seen that the proposer has found 100 bucks, right? So as a result, the responder knows very well how much the proposer gets after the responder accepts or doesn't accept. This is what happens in the next stage of the game. The responder gets to say whether they accept the offer or they don't. Now, here comes a tricky bit in the rules of the game. If the responder rejects, then the hundred bucks suddenly magically disappear and both get nothing. So the proposer better proposes something which the responder can't reject. Otherwise, he also gets zero, which given their potential gain, is a pure loss of nearly 100. So you better think twice before proposing something very low. Finally, the rules of the game say that any accepted offer will be implemented as is. In other words, if a certain split is proposed and accepted, it gets implemented and both are happy with it, no matter what. So here's a game tree. The game tree is like the payoff matrix for, for uh, sequential games, uh, right? But it's not in a matrix form. The reason we don't have a matrix here is that we have a sequence of play. We have a player who gets to say what happens first, and only then we have a player who can accept or reject the offer. So for example, the proposer may offer a split of 50-50. Yeah, that will be offer 50-50 or a split of 80-20. Now, if the proposer offers a 50-50 split, the responder then takes over and can accept or reject. If they accept, right? If they accept, uh, the split is implemented and they both get 50-50. If not, uh, then they both get zero. Exactly the same process happens if the responder receives an offer of 80-20. So, it's useful to think about two questions here. If you're a proposer, how much would you propose? Don't propose too much because you don't want to give out much more than what the responder will accept anyway, right? But at the same time, don't be too greedy because you may end up with nothing, right? 
This is what happens in the head of the proposer. And if you are a responder, uh, what's the minimum offer you would accept? You don't want to sell yourself too short and accept an offer that's too low. You don't want to reward the very selfish and non-altruistic behavior on the other hand, in which the proposer proposes something ridiculously low. But at the same time, is a zero payoff better than one? After all, we're all economists here, aren't we? A payoff is a payoff, no matter how small. Then what's your minimal acceptable offer? It turns out the answer varies across uh, countries and situations. And this is why this game is so cool to play in a variety of settings, because we'll learn so much about the various cultures from, uh, from playing it. So for example, take the result from the exact same game played, in, uh, played with students in the US and with farmers in, in Kenya. By all means, those two groups of people are different. As a result, they most likely care about different things. In other words, their utility function is somewhat different. And, and this is precisely what we see in, the, in this graph. In the graph, you see two pieces, two key pieces of information, right? On the horizontal axis, you see the fraction of the windfall proposed by the proposer. This fraction is then plotted against the fraction of the responders who accept the offer. I have a second to look at it. At the same time, you see how different these answers are for the farmers in Kenya and for students in the US. One of the striking differences happens at the, at the low end of the distribution, at the low offers. If a student responder gets an offer of 20 or even 10, they will most likely accept. However, look at the fraction of farmers accepting, accepting the offer when, when the stakes are very low. When, when faced with an offer of 10, only the most desperate farmers will accept. This is also true um, even when the offer is 20. Imagine, you can get $20 by just saying yes, but you still say no. Why? Why would you inflict a loss on yourself to harm others? One of the explanations is that people have a different sense of fairness across different cultures. For example, in Kenya, getting an offer of 20 looks like an insult because the other guy gets a whole lot more. This is why the fraction of accepted offers gets closer to 100, uh, 100%. When, when the offer starts resembling a fair split, right? On the other hand, for a student, any gain larger than zero is still a positive gain. They do place a higher weight in their utility function on the fact that they're getting a positive gain out of the interaction and not on the fact that the other guy is getting a whole lot more than them, right? So in other words, social or other regarding preferences can be used to model a variety of interactions. And the more interesting ones are when people perceive what the other people get as an important component of their own utility. Well, we'll see one more application of the ultimatum game during the live lectures this week. But now it's time to conclude what we've learned about social interactions. Thanks for watching.